Well, good afternoon, good evening, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Harry Brailsford again with the fifth installment of the MSP Tech Talk. A uh, little bit of housekeeping and then an update for you. So the housekeeping up front, be sure to use the question feature to ask your questions during the, the lecture. And we'll answer, uh, typically we answer every single one. So that works out pretty well. We've allowed enough time. Uh, upcoming events, uh, next week we have Carl Palachek with uh, the branding, installment number six. Uh, tomorrow we have a, a, a webinar um, from our good friends over at Veeam, <coughs> excuse me. And so if you want to go to smunation.com uh, forward slash webinars, you can join us on the high availability webinar tomorrow, so that's really cool. And then before you know it, in the U.S., we head into the holiday week, the 4th of July, but I have just secured all of my arrangements to go to, um, to, 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 go to the Microsoft Inspire Conference in Washington, D.C. We have our beer fast on the 9th. And so, uh, Ginny, if you could make note and the thank you note to these good people, um, let's give them the link to sign up for the beer fest. We're already halfway at capacity for the beer fest on July 9th, so you're going to want to hurry and sign up for that. Um, that's the Sunday of Inspire. I will have sufficient free time at Inspire to chit chat with you guys, so always welcome the chance to do that. Then before you know it, we turn the corner and we go to ChannelCon in Austin, uh, July 31st through August 2nd. That's the CompTIA event. Um, always a good one, and again, a chance to, to chit chat with you there. So that's a lot of the uh, that's a lot of the housekeeping. Um, here's an update for you. So Grant Thompson, who is uh, scheduled to be the speaker, is uh, had had a family emergency. Um, don't fret, it's it's okay. But he had an emergency come up and was unable to speak today. So we recruited. Uh, Paul Captainino um, out of Oxford, UK, to uh, to help us with the conversation on Azure Active Directory. Let me introduce Paul. Let's jump right into it. Uh, before we do that, though, we we want to thank Cenex and SQL Soft Three. Um, these are community sponsors. They make this possible. We have a business model. You have a business model. And of course, we're trying to we're, we're, we're trying to do the best we can to grow and support community, and it takes the generosity and the underwriting support of Cynix and SQL Soft Three for today. So appreciate that. We're going to hear from Cynix a little bit later. Uh, with that said, let me introduce Paul. So Paul is a senior consultant from Oxford Computer Group. Not surprisingly, over in the Oxford UK, I think that's uh, UTC minus seven timing, so it is more or less their evening and has spent much time in the last five years helping to migrate businesses large and small to Azure. Uh, Paul is also the lead trainer in Oxford Computer Group's training arm, OCG Learning, and regularly teaches their class-leading three-day Azure AD training courses. Paul, uh, really appreciate you helping us out. Boy, howdy, uh, you, you've dug deep on short notice, and I'm, I'm assuming it's just after 7 p.m. over in Oxford in the UK. Is that correct, my friend? Okay, I, uh, yes. Uh, hi, Harry. Actually, it's uh, just after 8. Oh, 8. Oh, I thought we were 7 off in the summer. We're 8? Oh, man. Okay, my bad. Hey, Paul, let's jump right into it. Today, is, we got a big crowd. we got great content. Sir, take it away, and I'll interrupt you with questions and whatnot periodically. Okay. Okay, so um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, good evening, if you are here in the UK. Um, I've been asked to put this session together to have a chat to you folks about uh, Azure Active Directory, more uh, accurately to look at some of the uh, best features um, of Office 365 that uh, are only really available if you um, activate the Azure Active Directory tenancy that you get when you implement uh, Office 365. So we're going to have a look at some underused features, some features that you should be using, uh, some features that you may consider. Um, and we're just going to have a quick run through. Obviously, we don't have very long. Um, around kind of uh, half an hour into my chat, we're going to break for, uh, I understand, a uh, video. Um, but then um, I'll then jump back in and continue talking to you folks. So. Um, 
yeah, so the session calls itself Azure Active Directory, uh, and we at Oxford Computer Group uh, like to think of ourselves as the uh, world leaders in uh, implementing, uh, or at least helping our customers move towards the cloud. Um, and at OCG Learning, which is our training arm, we have uh, several um, uh, mechanisms that you can use to contact us, but um, I'm not going to bore you with those. Let's get straight on with some kind of uh, uh, learning. Okay, so my agenda for today is to show you um, activating Azure AD for Office 365. Um, I'm sure you know that when you implement Office 365, you always get an Azure uh, tenancy. Typically, though, you don't use it. You configure Office 365 through the um, Office portal, which we'll have a little look at. Um, but uh, some of the, what's the right word? Let's use the word sexy. Some of the sexy features that um, uh, Office 365 can give us, um, we really need to have, have uh, activated our Azure AD underneath um, so that we can actually uh, make that work. Uh, we'll then have a look at uh, one of those sexy features, of course, is uh, customizing the branding to make sure that to your users or your customers' users that they feel like they're logging on to their own uh, systems. Um, so we'll have a quick look through that. Uh, and talking of logging on, we'll have a look at um, signing on in a, a hybrid environment and um, launching uh, applications. There's a couple of portals uh, that uh, users may or may not be using to access applications, so um, something worth uh, discussing. We'll also enable uh, MFA and see that working. Um, I don't know how clearly you'll be able to hear my mobile phone when we're enabling the MFA, the multi-factor authentication, but uh, hopefully you'll see that. And then we'll finish off today with a little chat about something called Azure AD Domain Services. This is something only just enabled uh, by uh, Microsoft. Again, uh, not something uh, most Office 365 customers use, but uh, should be and will be in the future once uh, people like us, of course, who uh, help them um, implement their systems uh, start to understand exactly what it is. Okay. So um, my standard chat in uh, this case starts with a uh, talk about Azure AD. Um, Azure AD, of course, is a, a directory built for cloud scale. So Microsoft are talking like 2 billion authentications a day, 5 million organizations using it, um, which means that uh, protocols like uh, Kerberos um, are not so easy to use. Um, in uh, such huge quantities, so we need uh, a bit more uh, slick ways of uh, signing in, um, for example. Uh, um, and so uh, Azure AD is built for that, for, for cloud scale, that, that kind of a scale are listed there. Of course, um, Azure AD provides the authentication and directory information for Office 365, um, which is what we're going to be uh, concentrating on uh, mostly today. Um, although it is possible to, uh, as I'm sure you know, to purchase an Azure AD tenancy outside of Office 365 that you may choose to use to um, provide access to your customers to um, several uh, third-party SaaS apps. Um, and I say several, and I mean, I should be saying uh, several uh, thousand, I guess. So um, depending on the size of the organization that you work with, they're going to be uh, typically uh, an organization of more than uh, uh, 10 users is going to probably already have uh, AD uh, on premise. Um, so they have, in that case, uh, perhaps uh, domain controllers and perhaps uh, SharePoint servers, or maybe, of course, a small business server uh, running, providing the domain controller capabilities and um, the application capabilities that the customer requires, a database on SQL Server, uh, this kind of information uh, all on-premise. The problem with this, of course, is it means that um, these uh, devices have to be maintained. And what we'd really like is to maintain these devices, uh, these uh, applications and uh, data um, somewhere less expensive, okay? um, which is where, of course, Microsoft's uh, driver for Azure AD uh, comes from. And so what Microsoft have done is they've purchased lots of data centers, built lots of data centers, uh, purchased space in other organizations' data centers around the world. They've uh, developed a technology which basically looks like a shipping container that contains a bunch of racks um, and those racks are filled with uh, computing power and uh, disk space and uh, network capabilities. And they ship those uh, containers to these uh, data centers. Um, and kind of weirdly, 
uh, uh, even if bits fail, they, they still leave them running until something like that. They have a special algorithm, but let's say 40% uh, of the devices in one particular uh, container fails. They just uh, take the container away, throw it away, and put another container in with, again, uh, working uh, uh, information. The, the way that they can do that, or working hardware, should I say, the, the, the reason that they can do that, of course, is inside these containers there are racks. Um, each of those racks has a, a fabric switch, and that fabric switch can lightning fast switch between the different um, services uh, available. Let's say we're talking about compute services here. So you switch between the, the different uh, uh, CPUs uh, and uh, perhaps also switch between uh, different uh, disk systems. Um, and so um, the way that they've, they've built it is they then have a, a load balancer that load balances between those racks, um, uh, guaranteeing in each location that your data is in at least three separate racks in the uh, storage locations and um, the, the, the load balancer and the, and the fabric controller make very fast access uh, to that data, which means when, of course, uh, uh, one disk or some of the, the disk subsystems fail, um, the load balancer won't even pick things up from there or the fabric controller won't pick things up from there and they'll switch uh, very quickly. Um, and then uh, worldwide, there's then an interface uh, into this uh, cloud infrastructure. Um, the interface, uh, when Microsoft originally put this together, was invented by a guy called Dave Cutler. I don't know if you know Dave Cutler, but he's a much. Oh, player. I, Paul, I, if you don't mind, boy, that guy was legendary. <laughs> oh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, uh, and he had a little bit of a uh, little bit of attitude for those of you that don't know. <laughs> so but. they say. So Paul, I couldn't let that slip by. Please continue, my friend. <laughs> Thank you, Harry. So um, the legend has it that uh, Dave, um, who invented VMS and then uh, invented from that Windows NT, so you know he's been around for a while inventing uh, things that we use. When Microsoft were talking about this uh, worldwide uh, switching technology that they required, um, to, to enable um, Azure to work. Um, he uh, was the main architect on the project and uh, they couldn't think of a name for this uh, interface. And so the story goes, him and his uh, team were driving through Redmond. Um, I know probably some of you know Redmond. Um, there's a uh, famous bar in Redmond, we'll call it a bar, um, although I'm pretty sure that Dave claims that he thought it was a dog grooming um, uh, place, um, and it's called the Pink Poodle. Um, and when they saw this place, Pink Poodle, they said, oh wow, that's a great name for the technology, let's call it Pink Poodle. They decided against that in the end and kind of um, uh, made it sound a little bit more techy by calling it the Red Dog Front End. Um, so uh, uh, that's what Dave Cutler really invented was the Red Dog Front End, which is um, a, um, I guess we can call it lightning fast way of switching between these different uh, load balancers around the world who can then switch lightning between the different um, fabric controllers to make sure that we, when we access the data, the data is just there. Um, we don't know where it is necessarily, um, although it is possible um, to pay Microsoft to say, yes, uh, I need my data stored in, uh, I don't know, um, Germany, the, the German government, for example, um, is uh, very hot on making sure that their data is only stored in, well, I guess Western Europe, not necessarily just Germany. But so they pay to have their redundancy within uh, the Western Europe region. Whereas uh, if you don't choose to, to, for those options, the Red Dog front end can lightning switch you to any of these places. Your data could be in any of these places. Um, and of course, uh, Microsoft handle uh, the, the way that you get access to the resources. And the resources are really, uh, of course, um, computing power and disk space and uh, networking. Um, Microsoft have improved. I'm sure Dave Cutler wouldn't agree that they've improved, but they have, I guess with his blessing, um, uh, added uh, new features and um, perhaps better ways of uh, combining the resources together. And now this front end um, is really called the um, Azure Resource Manager. And the Azure Resource Manager is, uh, again, did what the Red Dog front end does, but does it in a slightly better way. The resources are kind of um, combined together in a way to, to make um, the data better accessible because of the locations where things are. And so we use an interface into either the Red Dog front end or the Azure Resource Manager. Um, 
to then uh, create uh, Office uh, 365. We say, yep, we want to enable Office 365. And what happens then, somewhere in some of this technology, somewhere around the world, a, a directory is created. Um, it is called a directory. It's Azure uh, Active Directory. Um, when you sign up, you get, you get what's called a tenancy. Um, but of course, what you're also signing up for is a subscription. Microsoft use that term subscription to mean various things in Azure. Uh, but basically, your tenancy slash uh, subscription um, gets you a, a directory. Um, and in that directory, you can then uh, create uh, domains. Um, and those domains, of course, then uh, typically would match up with you slash your customers' uh, Active Directory uh, domains. Um, so uh, let's um, scribble out all the hardware and just say here, OK, so you now have a directory with a domain uh, in the cloud. And by the way, if you are using Office 365, that's what you basically see, one directory with a default domain um, which is typically the name of your um, company um, because you have to register it to make sure it's unique. But so let's call ourselves your company. Um, so it'll, it'll be your company dot on Microsoft dot com. Um, then Microsoft uh, enable you to create uh, domains within that uh, directory, uh, and typically you would create a directory then called your company dot com, uh, and that's where your users would then be uh, stored. Uh, so it's a, really an identity store to store your users and, of course, to uh, validate your users. Again, strictly speaking, you don't know where your accounts are created. You don't know where the disks are. Um, and I guess for most organizations, as long as the data is available, uh, they really don't care. Like I said, some uh, organizations do care, and they pay Microsoft the appropriate amount of money to uh, create those resources in uh, appropriate places. But then if you only have uh, five users, you manually add them to uh, your Azure uh, Active Directory, and you then uh, enable the appropriate licenses. And when you have an Azure Active Directory and your user account, um, and you do this per user, you enable the appropriate license, then uh, the user can then access that particular application. Um, so Office 365 makes available, of course, lots of different applications one of which is um, Exchange Online. So if you've been given Exchange Online uh, license, then magically, uh, in the background, uh, based somewhere around the world, Microsoft create you a mailbox. Um, and that mailbox can then be accessed uh, by your uh, user uh, to be able to, of course, uh, read the data that's in this mailbox, and the mail can be sent to that user. Now, there are some tricky configurations you have to worry about if you still have on-premise exchange, um, and you want to migrate users uh, slowly from on-premise to on-cloud, uh, and then enable those. Um, but we'll kind of talk about some of that um, a little bit later. OK. So um, then, so, so you have a directory. Uh, so when you basically, you, you go to the Microsoft website, you say, I want Office 365. Without you knowing, it creates you uh, an Azure tenancy with a directory, as we said, called yourdomain.onmicrosoft.com. Then uh, you can use the appropriate tool. And the appropriate tool is uh, this guy right here. He said, struggling to find um, Internet Explorer. There we go. Um, and if I go to uh, portal.office.com, when I have um, established um, a, a tenancy and Office 365, oh, notice, by the way, now I'm going to uh, my account. When I chose that my account was in my domain, I've still left my domain as a, an on Microsoft.com domain for, for my demonstration. Um, but notice it's gone to a, uh, a branding that, that is for me, not the uh, default branding. We'll talk about how to set that up uh, in a moment. Then I'm going to log on as the uh, user account. Uh, bear with me one second. Uh, OK. Man, I forgot how many times I've typed the right word in there. Um, now I'm regretting having a password as long as this. OK. You know, uh, I just, I... You know yes. Paul, while, okay. while you're doing that, and, and again, if you don't mind, my style is to be a provocateur. Oh, go me. ahead. <laughs> but uh, it, 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 it pre appreciate the, the journey you're taking us on. But boy, howdy, I'll tell you, I, uh, I just had password troubles today myself, man. So. <laughs> 
I, I feel your pain, but uh, I'll go back on mute. Okay, I'll go back on Thank mute. Thank you very much, Harry. <laughs> I think the world would be a better place if nobody had any passwords, but everybody was trustworthy. Yeah. Having said that, we'd probably be out of a job, so perhaps we don't like that idea after all. But so there I have uh, uh, logged on to um, the Office 365 portal. Remember, I went to um, portal.office.com. Uh, in Internet Explorer. Um, this is a, a, a portal, of course, that gives me access to uh, my Office 365 tenancy. Um, as it happens, I have, in my demonstration, given my user account um, a bunch of licenses to be able to use uh, all of these different applications. And so this is how a user might choose to use applications. But um, we're getting a bit of ahead, ourselves of, ahead of ourselves at the moment. What I want to do is uh, show you that admin. Okay, so uh, typically uh, you sign into Office 365 immediately uh, into the admin center. In the admin center, you then have uh, access to all sorts of uh, uh, exciting um, goodies. Um, one of which is this ability to add a domain, um, and then from here, so, so remember the domain that gets created for you by default is a unique name dot on Microsoft dot com. The unique name is a name that you've specified, uh, that is, of course, uh, uh, part of your uh, organization. Um, Microsoft will make you prove that you do own that domain if you try to do this. If I try to add a domain um, and I try to add any domain uh, right here, um, it's going to need to talk to uh, DNS on the internet um, to establish that I do own that domain because the domain I specify, it'll then say, okay, go and add a uh, text record um, to that domain, uh, to that domain's DNS, and Microsoft will then, as you can see in the second step, uh, verify that that domain actually is there. So by default, they give you a tenancy with a dot on Microsoft.com domain. Of course, they own dot on Microsoft.com as a namespace, so uh, they can be very specific that it is unique, um, but when you try to then create a unique domain under there to store your user accounts, you have to be uh, very sure that, uh, or they have to be very sure that you are who you say you are. Um, and the way that we do that on the internet, of course, is we register the name with an internet service provider, and then that internet service provider may or may not give us access to uh, DNS, and if it does, we can then uh, manage our own DNS, um, and uh, when we do, we can then add the record that Microsoft uh, uh, tells us to put in um, to prove, basically, that we own that domain. So, strictly speaking, when you sign up to Active Direct to Office 365, you get um, uh, an Azure AD uh, directory called dot on Microsoft.com, and then you create a domain. By the way, that Microsoft directory called dot on Microsoft.com, sorry, called your company name dot on Microsoft.com, or there also in there is a domain created called your company dot on Microsoft.com, and that's where your default admin user. Uh, is uh, created uh, as well. Um, you then add your uh, custom domain, um, and of course you have to prove that you own it, and uh, there you go, uh, that's established. Okay. And so typically that's what we do when we set up Office 365, uh, and then we administer it, as I uh, just showed you, through the uh, Office portal, which as you can see, lets me see um, users uh, that exist in my uh, Azure uh, domain, uh, there they all are. Um, it also lets me license those users if I want to. I can select uh, Adam here, for example, and um, when I uh, view him here, I can choose to give him a uh, license by clicking Edit next to his uh, product licenses. Of course, I can edit other attributes about him too. Um, he needs to be given a, a location, and of course, um, we can then uh, enable the license, and maybe when we enable Office 365, um, that actually we only want him to have, I don't know, um, perhaps just um, the um, Exchange Online and uh, Exchange Online uh, components. So we can you know, disable, or, uh, we can be quite granular with uh, what applications a user can see. Now, of course, if we've only got 10 users, using this interface to do this is uh, kind of acceptable. If we've got uh, several hundred, several thousand, if we're an enterprise with several hundred thousand users, um, then uh, using this interface to assign licenses is kind of uh, uh, not really a good idea. Um, so if we go back a couple of slides. Um, so to gain access to this, uh, uh, to the cloud, I showed you you've got portal.office.com, which is always there for Office 365. Um, you um, 
have a couple of uh, client um, portals as well, which we will have a very quick look at in a moment. Um, and um, you uh, may choose, not everybody does, but you may choose to also um, enable the behind the scenes uh, Azure uh, capabilities that uh, Azure can give you too. If you do that, then you uh, uh, what you do is you access it basically the same um, domain, but this time via the Azure portal called portal.azure.com. When you access portal.azure.com, notice in my case it's automatically logged me straight in as that same admin. That's because um, the Internet Explorer is um, let's say ultra clever and uh, can uh, uh, work out that I've uh, logged in once here and uh, can then log me straight into where else I'm trying to log into. Um, sometimes we don't like that but hey that's the way of the world. Um, and in Azure I've then got a, a whole bunch of options that I can uh, uh, use to configure my system here including and what I want to show you is the Azure Active Directory options and then from here um, I could perhaps manage uh, my users and groups um, from these uh, blades available, to, they're called blades, these um, little uh, pages um, and uh, uh, you can access them by um, clicking options in the navigation bar or um, the actual blade itself. So if I want to look at users, here I can see exactly those same users and again I, oh, I didn't mean to do that, I, notice I can delete the user but also when I select the user uh, I can uh, choose to um, configure him, uh, if I choose his profile for example, um, I can again change some attributes uh, for that user as appropriate um, including of course uh, uh, licenses like I did in the Office 365 portal. Um, that, and uh, other options available here, of course, include I'm um, giving him a role in my Azure uh, directory. Um, at the moment, he's just a user, but I can make him, um, uh, for example, a global administrator or a limited administrator, and I can set up various limited administrators to do what I need. Um, if I've signed up to an Azure Active Directory premium um, uh, subscription, I get many more options available uh, to me um, than is available here with my uh, basic Azure AD which I get when I um, sign up for uh, Office 365. But um, for some reason a lot of people don't kind of figure that Office 365 is Azure and they kind of miss some of the interesting and exciting things that I can do uh, in my uh, Azure tenancy. Um, so um, that's what we're going to have a look at uh, today. Hey, um, Paul. Yes, who's this? Yeah, Paul, it's the bottom of the hour, so I need to do a little bit of housekeeping, my friend. Okay. Take a, if you want to go on mute for a second or whatnot, take a sip of uh, fresh water, and sure. um, we'll do a little bit of housekeeping. So huge crowd today. If you came in late, uh, you're attending the fifth installment of the MSP Tech Talk online series. Um, we, we've had a lot of success. Uh, Je Jenny and I are actually in the early, early planning phases for the fall edition, so keep your ears open. Um, housekeeping, uh, July 9th, SMB Nation Beer Fest at WPC, now known as Inspire. You can catch it on our webpage. We'll also send you an announcement. Um, that is uh, part of the, uh, in, in Washington, D.C., part of the WPC conference now called Inspire. Also, uh, ChannelCon by CompTIA. We'll see you down there. Um, we have several questions building up, and Paul, I think... Uh, these community presentations possible uh, has a pretty cool video. Jenny, are we ready to rock on that one? We are ready. Here we go. Okay, and I think, Jenny, is it only computer speaker? If you're, if you're on a phone, you will not hear it, so you're going to need to turn on those computer speakers.
Hey, that's pretty cool. I turned on my computer speakers, Jenny, this time, so uh, I, I, I was right there with everybody. So, uh, Rebecca, I believe you're here from Cynix. I see Mark online, but Rebecca, I believe I'm going to have a conversation with you today. Is that correct? That's correct. Can you hear me? I can. So, Perfect. first of all, where are you? Are you out in, in, in the Carolinas? Yes, so we are, we've got um, a sales headquarters located in Greenville, South Carolina. Okay, okay, great. Uh, so I'll tell you what, I, a standard question that, that we have um, relates to uh, the Cloud Advisor program and going to the uh, Cloud, uh, the CSP program. Um, don't know if you want to hit that one head on because I, th I think we have a deadline coming up pretty quickly, so that's a timely conversation. <laughs> Yes, most definitely. So as you may or may not be aware for the audience on the line or on the call right now, um, Microsoft is pushing um, and closing the advisor fees on June 30th. So after June 30th, any partner that has a client transacting Office 365 or other cloud products through the advisor program, you as a partner will no longer earn the back-end managed fees of the 3% that you're currently making right now. Um, so now is um, not a better time than more than ever to transition your customers over into CSP with the next today. So any questions that you guys have um, around our program itself, um, or around the CSP program in general, um, Synex is more than happy to get on the phone with you um, and answer any questions that you have. Yeah, that's how, no, that sounds great. For, forgive me, I went on mute. i always sensitive to make sure we have the highest sound quality um, on a webinar. But, uh, and then will Cynix have a presence at the Microsoft Inspire conference in Washington, D.C., July 9th through the 13th? Are, are you aware that Cynix will be there with a booth or a presence? Yes, we will um, both have a booth and a presence, and we have about, um, I think, 12 to maybe 13 um, people from the Microsoft and the CloudSolve team that will be attending WPC for the full week. Or Inspire, okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> Same change. Yeah, so. I, well, I know. I, I go through this every <laughs> single day. You're not alone. I was on a call yesterday with Microsoft, and we we're both fumbling over the uh, the branding change, the name change. Um, some of us on the phone remember when it was called Fusion back in the late <laughs> 1990s. So, don't want to age right. ourselves. <laughs> yeah, Rebecca, and I'll be attending we'll, there as the CSP uh, BD lead. So, you know, look out for me um, at the Cenex booth. Okay, great. Well, I you know I appreciate catching a second with you. Uh, thank. You. answer the uh, polling question that's on the screen right now. While you're doing that, uh, I have a question directed at myself from Alan Brinker. Alan, uh, you're asking why am I not in the Silicon Valley this week? Um, that is a fair question. I was going to have a beer fest last night, Tuesday night, and that trip got postponed till mid-July. So I'm going down to do, for one of our other sponsors on the series, uh, Fortinet, um, they pushed out the video till mid-July, so Alan, I'll keep you posted. Bear with me, but that trip just got changed, so no beer last night, if you didn't notice. <laughs> um, Jenny, go ahead and close the poll, and let's return uh, to our presenter, Paul, and, and get this party back on the road. Folks, we'll ask your other questions. Scott, Timothy, Corey, and Oren will ask your other questions a little bit later. Thank you very much. Paul, you're back on. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, I presume you can still see my screen. Um, yes, sir. In which case, yes, sir. Okay, I'll just continue. Okay. So we were just saying that um, what do you do if you have uh, 10 users? You just add them to your Office 365 uh, tenancy via the portal to office.com. Um, but, uh, or, or I should call it the Office 365 admin portal. Um, or if you've got lots of users in your on premise, on premise AD, then somehow, You've got to get those users into the cloud. Microsoft, Microsoft provide us um, a, a system to enable us to do this called Azure AD Connect. Azure AD Connect is um, an upgrade from uh, a tool called DirSync or DIR Sync, which is a, 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 was then upgraded to a tool called um, AD Sync. And I was told uh, by Microsoft only uh, what three weeks ago that 
those two products are now actually deprecated. That means um, DirSync and uh, ADSync are no longer uh, tools you should be using. Um, so you need to get those upgraded as soon as you can to um, AD Connect uh, if you want your system to continue working. And basically with AD Connect, um, mildly irritatingly because what we're doing is pushing to the cloud, it's an on-premise system, um, uh, although it could of course be in a, a VM. Um, and that on-premise system uh, connects to your Azure AD. Um, you can use it to then import into uh, the AD Connect uh, your uh, users and groups and contacts that exist on your on-premise AD. You then, once you've imported them into the system, you apply some rules, and those rules uh, take objects that uh, started their life in AD and gets them ready to be exported to Azure, um, uh, by uh, applying the rules, and the rules apply every half hour. So every half hour, you're, uh, it, although it does change with different versions of the product, but basically every half hour you're importing objects, applying the rules, which might change them slightly. Um, I don't know, add extra attributes, remove attributes. Perhaps you might say, I only want to apply these rules to users in this department. Um, and then uh, Azure AD Connect with them on an export, to write these users out to uh, Azure. And that's a great way to uh, populate uh, all of your uh, Azure uh, domain with uh, all of your users uh, from AD. Um, most organizations we know run in this kind of situation called hybrid, um, uh, where you have um, users in both locations. Um, and one of the things that uh, AD Connect can do is not only can it sync the users and groups and contacts to Azure, it can also um, sync uh, the passwords. More accurately, it never writes the password to the cloud. What it basically does is it takes, uh, you know, the passwords are stored in uh, AD in a hash. It takes a hash of the hash um, and sends the hash of the hash to uh, Azure. And when somebody logs in via uh, the Azure AD, um, then uh, their password that they type in is then hashed and hashed again, um, and only then uh, it is then tested against the hash of the hash that's stored in Azure AD, um, and uh, that way um, we the users use the same password in both locations to log on, and uh, it, it gets um, less and less obvious to the users as to which directory is actually uh, authenticating them. Some organizations can't work with this situation, in which case they have to enable um, single sign-on. Um, and single sign-on still needs identity sync, where we uh, sync the users to Azure, but then in our Azure directory, we enable um, federation. Um, once we've enabled federation, what we've basically said is that user accounts in Azure can't have passwords, so when somebody tries to log on, um, what the system will do is use a federation service. There are a, a few that work uh, uh, with uh, Azure, including um, a, a tool called Ping Federate, another tool called Shibboleth, but of course the Microsoft tool is uh, ADFS, the uh, Active Directory Federation Services, that um, can uh, sync back uh, the password call back to AD. Um, and of course, we'll discuss how this works uh, in a second. I'm kind of um, conscious that uh, we uh, are taking a long time to describe these things, so I'll try to uh, move uh, swiftly through what we're doing. So um, when you're configuring Azure, you configure it, uh, if it's Office 365, through the Office 365 Admin Center, which is available if you're an administrator, uh, via portal.office.com. Of course, portal.office.com is available anywhere in the world. Um, you just need internet access. Point it at portal.office.com. It'll prompt you to log in. When you log in with an account um, that is in your uh, Azure uh, domain, then uh, obviously you can then, if you are an administrator, click admin and then be able to administer um, your uh, Office 365. Um, if you want to administer some of the extra sexy features available to you by uh, using your Azure tenancy, you log into portal.azure.com, as I uh, uh, just showed you, and from there, you can then get access to uh, the said uh, sexy features. Um, it is also possible to do all of this work with PowerShell. There's a special version of PowerShell, uh, a special module of PowerShell called um, the Azure uh, PowerShell module, um, which you can integrate into uh, PowerShell on uh, uh, any 
and PowerShell in your systems. Um, and from there, you can also uh, configure, you know, Microsoft include a whole bunch of PowerShell commandlets to basically enable you to do everything that you can do through the portals um, by uh, PowerShell. Um, and uh, just so you're aware, if you have uh, any developers um, in your organizations, um, it is possible with a little bit of uh, development work to enable the um, data that's in Azure to be exposed by the Graph API. The Graph API was um, basically invented by uh, Facebook. Um, and the idea is, I'm sure you've seen it, several websites that you can go to where you want to store, they need, the website needs to store data about you. You can prove who you are to that website by saying, log on via Facebook. Um, and basically what that does is it uses the Graph API to go to Facebook to A, prove who you are, and then B, um, extract something unique about you, usually your email address, and then your email address will be stored in that uh, um, organization's uh, uh, database, along with whatever that organization is storing uh, about you. Um, so uh, most of the websites that do things like that, that use the Graph API, enable you to log on via Facebook or by Gmail, um, but you may have noticed more and more of those websites now have the button that says uh, use Azure or a Microsoft account. Um, and uh, so, again, um, if you're uh, configuring your uh, Office 365 system using the Azure AD capabilities, then uh, the Graph API can also be uh, used. It does take a little bit of uh, development work, um, but I'm sure there are lots of companies in the planet who could help you with that um, to enable you to uh, uh, use that capability uh, if you uh, require. So. Um, Users, though, if I'm a user and I want to access my um, Azure, notice that uh, as I went uh, here to the Office 365 portal and I used um, this button here, which is my application launcher, I can see all the applications in Office 365 that I have uh, licenses for. Um, and because I'm logged on as administrator, I uh, chose uh, admin. Uh, and I can, uh, of course, I click that. But also, I could click mail. Um, and uh, get access to uh, Exchange Online um, to be able to read uh, the emails that uh, have been sent to uh, my particular, uh, or in this case, that administrator account in my um, demo uh, tenancy. Um, so users can use the portal.office.com as well to access data. What I'm going to do is launch uh, Internet Explorer here in, uh, in private mode. Um, what do they call that in um, Google? They call it uh, incognito. Um, uh, so with this case, it won't uh, log me straight in by taking my login from somewhere else. And so from here, I can go to a portal. Oh, I didn't want to go to that one. I wanted to go to a portal, which is um, portal.office.com. But in this case, I'll go as a somebody else, like a user in my system called um, at team M, who is in my uh, uh, test domain, which is called uh, EMS um, 708113.onmicrosoft.com. And uh, again, as you can see, uh, as soon as I uh, type in my domain name and then go down to my password prompt, it automatically knows that, uh, you know, I've already associated my domain name basically with uh, branding uh, for uh, my domain. Um, and you can see, excitingly, it then puts up uh, my uh, awesome uh, EMS training uh, picture. Um, so I'll show you how to enable that branding in uh, one second. Um, I then uh, supply my uh, password. Okay. Um, I think I might have put an extra number in there that I don't need. Uh, okay, and there I've now uh, successfully uh, logged in. And you can see, based on the fact that this user has um, uh, appropriate um, uh, licenses assigned to him, he gets a slightly different look than the administrator gets. When he clicks the application launcher, uh, because he has no licenses, you can see he has uh, basically no applications. Um, so when, we, when he logged in, he was taken to his account. Um, we can get to the account settings also by um, choosing the uh, settings options here and uh, here. Um, and he can configure uh, various things about himself. Um, some uh, personal info. Most of this, of course, comes uh, straight from uh, Office 365, but if it hasn't been synced with that Azure AD uh, Connect, 
then um, he might be allowed to update uh, some of these attributes. Um, and uh, so this portal is a little bit more than just a place to launch your applications. He might also use the other main, uh, yeah, so that was um, the Office 365 portal. Um, the user might also use the um, uh, My Apps portal, another portal that Microsoft make available, myapps.microsoft.com. And then from here, again, um, as you can see, uh, it makes available applications. In this case, um, it's making available applications that I actually uh, don't have permissions to. Notice if I try to um, use that uh, uh, mail system, the reason it's doing that, uh, uh, giving me those applications, is because when I was playing around testing these things before my demonstration, I was just testing, giving the license and taking them away again. Um, but you can see that he couldn't use those uh, applications, even though it looked like he had more applications through uh, my apps. Um, the access panel, as it's sometimes called, compared to uh, Office. But if I switch back to my administrator, and this is what I'm supposed to be demonstrating uh, to you, in the uh, Office portal, I can find that uh, particular user, and I can say, well, actually, that particular user should be able to uh, access uh, resources. And when we do, um, what I have to do is basically give him a license. So I can give him that license manually, as you can see. I can give him that license by using um, PowerShell. Um, I would typically write a script that perhaps gave him the appropriate license that I wanted him to have. In this case, I'm going to enable all of the Office 365 components um, just for that one user. And then and that's enabled it. Um, and of course, you'll see now that when that user now, okay, I'm not sure what happened to my in private browser session, when that, there it is. Um, when that user uh, logs back out and uh, logs in, uh, I guess maybe we should uh, close the browser, that's what you're supposed to do when you log out. Um, we'll start another uh, in private browsing session, we'll point at uh, let's say uh, portal.office.com and now you notice because I've given him those extra licenses nothing more exciting than watching me uh, type in usernames and passwords mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Again, notice the branding. And now you'll notice when he logs in that just because I've assigned him that license, already you can see um, his, uh, he's having these different tiles are, are suddenly available to him. Um, notice not the admin tile because he's not an admin. Um, but again, I can get to those same tiles by clicking these buttons. As you can see, some of these are still being set up. Um, because, of course, I've only just enabled the license. As you enable the license, your tenancy enables the appropriate applications, and then uh, you can use them. Um, so what you have to work out, of course, when you're going to use your Office 365 is, um, A, what applications people are going to use. B, you then uh, use the appropriate tool, either the admin center or um, the Azure portal, um, to enable the appropriate licenses for the appropriate users and then magically they can uh, use those uh, applications as I have uh, just shown you. As I also mentioned, if, and not everybody does, but if you have um, decided to launch the Azure portal as well as the Office portal when you're managing your organization, um, administering your organization, you'll notice in the Azure portal when you're looking at your directory, um, you'll notice that uh, from there, I actually have this ability to configure uh, company branding. And from here, um, I can choose, there's that, that picture that uh, you guys I saw, I know you're excited to see that, um, but the banner image um, still said uh, Microsoft Azure, but I can change this to um, an appropriate option here. Um, and I can also change some uh, signing text. Let's just uh, type uh, Paul was here, uh, just to show you where that text appears. Um, 
and I can choose our background colors here um, uh, and I can even choose the logo that appears um, when you use uh, uh, mobile access to that same option um, and uh, okay I want to save all of that um, so uh, people say yeah I've enabled Office 365 now what well, one of the first things you do is you brand it so it looks like your uh, organization, um, which means that then when your uh, users then uh, access the uh, system by using, for example, the, uh, let's use the My Apps portal this time for AppTeam, we can see that when our user AppTeam uh, logs in, um, okay, um, that uh, he's got the appropriate uh, branding. Um, obviously, at some point, he's still logged in somewhere because it automatically logged him in. But I also want to show you, of course, remember before when I clicked mail, uh, it didn't work. We said uh, when something had gone wrong. Oh, now I've enabled the license. Um, once it's had a chance to finish creating the mailbox, um, then uh, he'll also be able to access his mail uh, uh, through this tool. Um, but I guess what I wanted to show you is... when he signed in. So, so this is the default look of the Microsoft uh, Azure uh, My Apps portal. Um, but then when you uh, uh, click somebody from your domain, notice it automatically um, picks up uh, the appropriate information, um, the, the picture, um, and uh, okay, um, hasn't had time yet to update, to update the banner. Um, but also uh, down here, um, it still says Contoso, where I think I showed you, I overtyped that with uh, Paul was here. Um, which I was hoping to show you, but um, obviously I went in too quickly. Uh, I haven't given it time to finish cooking uh, to make that available. Um, so, um, but anyhow, what you're supposed to leave there thinking is, wow, how exciting. Although there is default branding of these Microsoft portals, the Red Dog front end and the Azure Resource Manager front end enables me to put my own branding if I use um, the Azure configuration, in which case I can then, of course, uh, configure my system uh, with uh, logos for my organization. Um, one thing to note, by the way, is um, if you have a, a, a photo here, um, the logo, if it's too big, um, starts from the top left um, and works down. So you should always, even though we put the word Contoso down there, we recommend that you uh, put your unique company information uh, at the top left because uh, everything else kind of gets squished up uh, towards that. Um, so that's where uh, your logos should go. Notice on a mobile, uh, again, uh, default branding, but we can put our own branding uh, as I tried to show you. Um, but it uh, um, took too long to uh, update. So um, I'm just going to pretend that you guys saw it and you were all excited about uh, the options available uh, right there. Other thing uh, worth mentioning, remember, is that you might say, yes, um, I want my users to be synced by uh, AD Connect to Azure. So they've got all my users in here. But some organizations don't like having their passwords in Azure, in which case what you can do is enable uh, a feature called uh, federation. Um, to enable federation, uh, what you basically do is you have to have some sort of federation server in your environment. Um, so it's unusual for a small organization who doesn't already have a federation server to choose this option. Um, remember, this option is when you are syncing your users to AD, sorry, to Azure AD, but you don't want them to have passwords in the cloud. Um, you can create a federation service. Um, uh, and typically, if you've already got one, then you would use it. If you didn't already have one, you typically wouldn't create one. But um, that federation service um, can then talk to Microsoft's federation server. More accurately, when you um, enable a federation in your domain, here, notice I've enabled federation. Let's change this to a little pen. Um, so I've enabled federation in Azure AD. I enable that with a PowerShell command line. And then basically all user accounts that exist in this AD uh, can no longer use their passwords. Okay, So the passwords that exist here are basically scrubbed. Uh, and the only password that exists from my user accounts are here. Remember the user account that's here, there he is, has been uh, synced by uh, uh, this guy, 
uh, to uh, here. Okay. He could have been synced with a password, but as soon as I turn on federation, um, and I'm basically saying no passwords in the cloud. Um, then I have to do a little bit of work with um, some uh, proxy services and um, the uh, DNS uh, configuration. Here we go. Um, so I've now got DNS configured in the cloud. Um, and just so you know, this DNS server um, would have um, an address typically called STS, the Secure Token Service, but actually the name, you can make up the name to be anything you like. Um, but there is sts.yourdomain.com, and the IP address that the DNS on the internet supports is the IP address of this uh, proxy who sits in your um, secure perimeter network. Um, we used to call them uh, a DMZ. Um, you can also have DNS on-prem. There's your on-premise DNS. And that on-premise DNS has the same name, um, sts.microsoft.com. He has IP address that actually points to that guy. Okay. And then a bit of magic can happen in this environment. If I'm sitting at a workstation uh, somewhere uh, outside of my um, premises, uh, perhaps at home or at a customer site or you know, internet cafe or something, and I try to log on to read my email. I go to log on. I say uh, my username is paul at uh, uh, um, ocglearning.com, uh, um, and uh, this guy here uh, then, instead of prompting me for the password, although it looks like he's prompted me for the password, when I click to go to the password prompt, what he does is he actually sends a message back in secret saying, oh, you can't give me a password because your account doesn't have one. Just send me a token from my ADFS server. Okay. So what he then does is he says, can I have a token, please, to log in? This ADFS server, this is how this is what the Federation does, basically says, no, you can't. Um, but what you need to do is get a token from your ocglearning.com federation server. So the client then talks to DNS and says, where's ocglearning.com federation server? And of course, uh, in this case, it's really sts.ocglearning.com. There's the IP address. That gets sent back to this user. Um, he then makes a connection to that server, says, can I have a token, please, to access um, Azure? And um, this guy here will then actually give him the landing page, there it is, that uh, asks for the password. So here then, the user supplies the password basically to something that belongs to me, not to Microsoft. Um, what that proxy does is he can forward that to this ADFS server. The ADFS server can check that username and password with AD, send that back here. Oh, sorry, he'll then generate the token, because he's a secure token service. Um, he sends a token to this guy. This guy sends a token back to my browser. Wow. The browser sends the token to ADFS to say, OK, now can I have a token, please? Here's a token that's proved who I am. And he says, yes, you can. He sends a token back to him, who can, and, and he can that supply that here to then log in. Wow. So what this means is, even without a password in Azure, um, I can enable federation uh, to make that work. Not all companies do, but companies who have policies that uh, uh, where they're worried about security and passwords on the internet and uh, hacking, um, instead of uh, the user supplying their password to Azure, they supply a username and then Azure says, get me a token. Um, the, if the person sitting at the same workstation here, or maybe I should do this in a different color, um, if the person sitting at a workstation here trying to do the same thing, trying to access his Office 365 email, for example, so perhaps um, Outlook, uh, it says get my, my email from here. Um, he'll say, uh, no, uh, you need a token to access me. Um, Outlook will then uh, send that message to this guy saying, can I have a token, please? He says, no, you can't. You've got to go to sts.ocglearning.com, which, of course, in this case is from that DNS. Um, and that DNS says, yeah, go to that server. He goes to that server. That server checks with AD, builds the token, sends it to directly to him, notice no passwords in this case, um, and uh, he'll then send that token directly to that guy, he'll build the right token to access uh, Azure, he'll send that back here, and eventually of course he'll send that to that. So um, obviously that takes a number of seconds, you see a dots going across the screen when you um, log in, um, and so a lot of organizations um, don't like passwords in the cloud, so we have to enable uh, this capability. In this capability, that means configuring 
uh, oh, sorry, don't configure that guy, but configuring uh, 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 ADFS here and here. Um, and also, to make all of this work, the um, first thing that happened was we ran the PowerShell that created that federation. At that time, when we're running that PowerShell, it also enables communication between um, this server and this server so that he has a certificate. He's going to use that certificate to encrypt his tokens, um, and he has to trust that. So you have a federation trust um, established. Um, now, uh, based on how long I've taken to uh, go through that uh, configuration, I'm, I'm not going to show it to you, but hopefully you've got a vague idea of um, uh, something sexy that you can enable for uh, Office 365. Um, so all you do in that case to enable that is your, you have to, of course, um, have access to your Azure AD uh, tenancy, um, and uh, then you can uh, run the PowerShell that enables that federation. And that basically removes all the passwords uh, from this guy. Um, uh, and of course, uh, at some point in the future, maybe you're going to migrate all your users from here to here, in which case, at some point, you're going to want to turn off that federation as well, um, so that users only ever log on via here. Um, but we imagine that that's going to be quite a long time in the future for any organization that has implemented a password federation. They are uh, unlikely to, um, within the next five years even, um, go all in cloud. Most organizations, we imagine, are going to be configured um, in that hybrid fashion. So two choices. I'm just going back a few slides. Um, uh, and when I do, two choices for uh, integration between on-premise and on cloud. And here we're talking basically um, uh, Azure uh, AD Connect, which is uh, syncing and including password hashes or um, federation. Uh, and so the architect has to decide what's right for your organization and configure those options. There are, of course, pluses and minuses for both. Um, but uh, that's how you implement those things. Uh, again, uh, to get your users there, in both cases, you're using uh, AD Connect. But you might choose to use um, the Azure uh, sign, uh, sorry, the uh, uh, federated sign-on um, to enable um, that uh, capability. Okay. Um, as you can see, then uh, you sign into uh, Office 365 by using either myapps.microsoft.com uh, or the Office 365 portal. Um, and either of those enable you to gain access to your applications. You, as users, can only gain access to applications that licenses have been granted for. It's also possible, um, and I have shown you these already, which is why I'm skipping over this quite quickly. It's also possible that you might want to enable a multi-factor authentication. Um, the problem with usernames and passwords is, A, uh, you have trouble typing them if you're somebody like me. Um, but B, um, uh, stealing that is, you know, the vulnerable uh, usernames and passwords to uh, social engineering. Um, so what Microsoft have done is they've added a third factor, uh, which is now called multi-factor, to uh, or second factor, should I say, which is now called multi-factor authentication, uh, to your logon process, where instead of just supplying um, a username and password, that's something you know, you also need um, something that you have. And in this case, Microsoft MFA is based on a product called Phone Factor. Microsoft purchased it from Phone Factor, the company, um, and uh, they've enabled it to work with uh, mobile phones. So notice that, again, per user, I can choose to do this. When I go to my portal as the administrator, um, I might choose, for example, for uh, Atchim, um, to not only supply a username and password, but also um, use a multi-factor authentication. Okay. Um, notice if I choose this option, then I can enable this on a per-user basis, or I can enable it for uh, the whole of the domain in uh, the Azure portal. When I choose it, I get the option to say which users 
should be using it. Notice multi-factor authentication is disabled for uh, at team at the moment. So I select him. I can select multiple users, of course, but in this case, I'll just use um, our, our favorite user and enable multi-factor authentication. When it enables multi-factor authentication, then uh, this user um, is now configured. Uh, refresh. He is now configured to be forced to use it, like you can see uh, Alex is enabled. Um, Okay, and there you can see uh, uh, AtTeam is now enabled. Um, but you'll also notice for the multi-factor authentication, um, I can also configure um, some configuration options for it as well. So there was the users, I can enable those. And I can also say they don't have to use it um, when they're coming from particular IP addresses. I can also say um, what multi-factor can they use? Um, is it going to be a call to a phone, a text message to a phone, a notification to a mobile app, um, a verification to a mobile app? Those apps um, work on um, any mobile platform you've ever heard of. So there's you know, um, options that you can download for uh, iPhones, for example. Um, but in this case, I'm going to put call to phone and text message to phone. I click save. And I have now configured um, AtTeam to be using uh, multi-factor authentication, um, which means, of course, that now when AtTeam tries to log on, again, I'm slightly worried I'm doing this uh, too quick for um, Azure to have cooked it properly, but let's see. If I go to now the My Apps portal and go to sign in as AtTeam, um, notice it's asking for his password as uh, before. Okay, so um, it's using MFA is in, in you know, another factor in addition to uh, the password. And when I click sign in, now you'll notice it's saying, okay, your admin is required for you to use additional security verification. Set it up now. He, just turning on my mobile phone's uh, speaker. Um, he, I'm in the UK. My phone number is... Um, Course you look away while I'm doing that and here I've got the option of calling me or sending a code by text I'm gonna say a call I click next and uh, I should be getting a phone call right now and when I do there you go answer the phone turn on my speaker so you can do it using Microsoft sign in verification system please press the hash key to finish your verification so I now press the hash key, and your sign -in was successfully verified. you'll notice Verify. that magically, so just another sexy feature, just by enabling the right options, um, it uh, has enabled me to um, uh, log in with that, uh, oh, sorry, first of all, I need to register that phone number, and now I can see that work. Every time I log in now, um, it will then ask me, uh, for you know, it'll phone me as well um, to make sure that I am me. Notice, by the way, it also creates something called an app password. Um, quite a, a an advanced topic, but some applications. If I've enabled this user to use MFA, and I'm using an application like Outlook that doesn't support MFA, um, uh, you can use these things called app passwords. Notice I've got a weird password there. I can stuff that password into Outlook when I use Outlook to access uh, Office 365 email. Um, instead of Outlook then doing multi-factor, it'll use this app password instead, um, and therefore only the Outlook clients that I put that in, i.e. the one on my laptop, um, is the only one that will be able to access my email. So, um, uh, so even for applications that uh, don't support um, MFA, uh, you can use that. So now you can see I've enabled that. Uh, AtTeam has logged in. Let me sign out as him once more. Um, I'm only going to show you this uh, once more. We uh, have nearly finished. You'll be pleased to hear. Um, although I know you guys like to listen to me going on and on. Um, but uh, sign out. Launch in private browsing again. As uh, sign in to, again, uh, perhaps the MyApps portal. So now every time AppTeam signs in, not only does he need to know his password, something he knows, he also 
has to have something that he has, which in this case is mobile phone. Notice it's calling me again. And every time he logs in, um, we, that's uh, how we've enabled it, because that's what I configured. And there, my phone is ringing. I've answered it. Microsoft sign-in verification system. Please press the hash key to finish your verification. So as uh, Achim presses his hash key, your sign-in will successfully verify. You'll notice that I, um, I'm not touching anything with the mouse or anything like that. He automatically just uh, verified, and I uh, logged in. So um, you can enable that uh, MFA capability. Um, via, uh, it's built into the cloud, okay, and great as you saw, very easy to implement. I can enable it for sets of users. I can also use it um, in this uh, concept called step up authentication. And again, um, for particular applications, I can say when he uses email, then do MFA. Um, and so, um, I, for example, I mean, that would be a bit irritating every time you try to read your email that you then had to get a phone call, but uh, probably no more irritating than every time you log in. Um, but so, again, another uh, underused uh, facility in um, Office 365, uh, because you can integrate it with uh, Azure, um, then uh, you can enable that uh, MFA. And as you can see, it can phone you, it can send you a text message, and you can even implement something in your application, sorry, on your mobile phone from the Google Play Store or um, wherever the heck else you download your um, app apps from. Um, there's an authenticator app um, that can work over Wi-Fi, uh, and again, it works exactly like that. Um, so that's something that you might choose to use as the user accesses um, either logging onto AD, uh, Azure AD, or using a cloud app. Um, Azure AD or the cloud app can call MFA, and then they have to have their phone as well to be able to gain access. Um, so uh, that's something you can enable, um, and it comes free, um, and you get uh, that functionality that I just showed you included with your uh, Office uh, 365. Um, capabilities. Okay, just one other thing I want to mention, um, and uh, this is um, the slides are now showing you something I've already showed you about how to implement it. Um, one other feature that you can enable for um, Azure AD in uh, an Office 365 tenancy, and this is something called Azure AD Domain Services. It's brand new, uh, only been out for a few months. Um, but what it basically lets you do is um, have a domain controller as a service. What? Um, what that's doing is kind of fuzzying up the link between what's on cloud and what's on-prem. On-prem, you have domain controllers that give you access to AD. Um, on the cloud, you have them too, but you don't know they're there. But it is possible to create a domain controller on the cloud by enabling um, Azure AD uh, domain services, and that basically, um, let's have a look, I've got a little picture here um, that will be my final uh, uh, discussion. So you have a little picture here where you have these Azure AD uh, domain services that I've enabled in Azure, and then when you do enable it, notice it creates you a domain controller um, that, you, uh, that automatically has all of these users in. And then if you have applications that need domain controllers, like, for example, um, you've got LDAP applications or applications that need Kerberos, or you want to apply certain group policies to be able to access various applications, then you can even do that in Azure in the cloud by enabling Azure AD uh, domain services. Okay. I'm kind of sorry that uh, I don't have another uh, hour to keep talking at you about this. Um, oh. <laughs> but uh, I'm going to stop talking now uh, because I've gone way over, 20 minutes over how long I was supposed to be talking to you. There were 97 of you when I started talking. There's only 84 left. Uh, well done for hanging on, uh, uh, you folks. Um, so uh, we at Oxford Computer Group, something I should mention, uh, we uh, run um, Azure AD courses um, that go on for three days rather than just an hour. Um, and we go into all these features in great depth. Um, you can find out about these by using this link uh, right here. We have one coming up in a couple of weeks in uh, Redmond. Um, use that link there, uh, and we'll leave that slide up while Harry does what he does to um, close us down. 
Sorry, no, absolutely. No, no, Paul, man, you know, you're like Kenny G, the saxophone player who can hold a note <laughs> for like 30 minutes, man. I mean, he has reverse breathing. Did, did, did you even take a breath? I mean, <laughs> uh, I find it easier if I don't breathe. <laughs> man, you should take up saxophone. I'm, I'm serious. Um, but uh, folks, we'll get you, so yeah, a little bit of housekeeping. We'll get you the link for this. Um, please uh, support those that support us. It, it, it makes a makes a difference since we're keeping not only community alive, but we're we're keeping it thriving. Uh, a couple of people were asking. Frank was asking uh, lots of good stuff. I think I need to replay the webinar. I'd say you know, amen, brother. Um, yeah. Oren Oren Risch was asking, is the webinar recorded? Yes, it is. So with that said. Uh, uh, Scott Buchanan is saying he's okay now that apparently you've asked, uh, answered Scott's question from earlier. Let's take it from the top. Um, Oren is asking, and, and forgive me, Paul, if you've actually answered this, you know, be, be, because these people asked the question earlier, but let's, let's, let's take it from the top. Um, does Azure have 80 like products that would allow workstations to join and apply GPOs to them? Okay, so uh, the answer to that question is yes, and that's exactly what this Azure AD Domain Services um, provides. So it's uh, an add-on to a normal Azure AD. Um, you enable the Azure AD Domain Services, and then a lot of those on-premise style uh, functions, you know, domain join, that kind of thing, um, will work successfully. Okay, and we have Corey Francis asking, uh, is it possible to connect via PS remoting or something rather than this web interface? Um, okay, so uh, technically no, um, but lots of third parties add um, lots, uh, you know, different interfaces that you might be able to use. So uh, to kind of uh, sidestep the question, uh, from Microsoft, no, but from other people, uh, yes. Um, you need to uh, get hold of, uh, well, I guess um, a little bit of work with Google might be able to help you, um, or uh, you can get hold of me at Oxford Computer Group and I can point you in the right direction for um, Okay, the, uh, and fully fledged answer to that question. But the answer is yes, from third parties. That actually brings up a, a question, and Paul, with your permission, we could include it in the thank you. Jenny will send it out this week. Um, what is Paul's email address, and will he be attending Inspire? So that's closely related about how people could reach you. Okay, so uh, yes, you can reach me by my email address. Um, Jenny's going to send that out, I guess, now you've said that, so uh, feel free, and by the way, you can email me over uh, anything that you want, even if what you want is consultancy, uh, we can always uh, start the conversation via an email to me, um, uh, but no, I'm not going to inspire, uh, Okay. not because I don't want to, but just because I'm too busy. Yeah, yeah, and then Scott Buchanan uh, had asked, I'll ask, Scott, I'm going to ask your question for the benefit of everybody. Um, and the question was, can I run group policies uh, in Azure Active Directory? Scott said you've answered it. Let's answer it again. Can okay, you run so group he's policies? absolutely right. I have answered it. And the answer is no, except if you enable Azure AD Domain Services, then uh, group policy can be run um, just as if you were running them on premises. Okay, we have Lawrence uh, Doyle. So, okay, he's actually signed off, but we'll ask his question. Uh, Larry's uh, in Dublin, Ireland. Um, okay. And so Larry was asking, when will uh, upgrade AD Connect to something that works consistently with reporting for what it does, uh, mm. for when it doesn't work? So I'm going to repeat that. When will there apparently be an upgrade to AD Connect to something that works consistently with reporting for when it doesn't work, doesn't work. Okay, so it's a great question, and actually um, I would point Larry at um, a website that I'm sure you guys are familiar with called GitHub. Um, Microsoft yep. used to have a thing called, uh, what did they used to call it? Um, I can't remember, but anyway, they've closed that down, uh, and they're moving everything over to uh, GitHub. There's a, a forum on GitHub 
specifically about Azure AD Connect and in there there's an awesome tool that somebody from Microsoft has written and therefore is bound to be built into the tool later which is a great reporting tool on for uh, Azure uh, AD Connect um, and it can give you uh, fully fledged reports on uh, what's happening and when and why um, and also there's another third party called uh, Software IDM and they have a product called Sync Panel um, and their Sync Panel product again can give you uh, detailed uh, up-to-date reports on uh, Azure AD Connect. Um, so I don't know Harry whether you need to write those two products down to send that information. I did. To, I, I did. Um, and Okay. And what I'm going to do, folks, I'm doing a send to all. Check your question window or chat window. I just did a send to all on that. Um, let me put it up in chat as well, and then I'm going to send that to uh, to Larry. Hey, hang, hang on, Paul. While I'm doing that, I'm going to I'm going to do some typing. But while I'm doing that, let's take another question. It was Larry. Uh, Doyle again. I think it might have been the same type of question. Are there third-party alternatives to AD Connect, uh, ADF, uh, ADFS alternatives as Microsoft ADFs need too many servers for small businesses? Does that make yeah. sense? Yes, it does. Okay. So the ADFS, yes. Um, I've mentioned uh, a couple of other uh, Federation products, um, one of which is much lighter than ADFS, which is called Ping Federate. Um, Ping Federate, well, you know, Azure AD uh, Federation is entirely compatible with uh, Ping Federate. Um, there are other tools as well, like uh, Shibboleth, but I would think Shibboleth is probably heavier than ADFS. But Ping Federate is the tool um, I think that Larry is looking for in this case. Okay, let me let me put that in, folks. Check your chat window. Uh, I just chatted this all up, and I'll get this to Larry up on. Uh, uh, Facebook. Um, I'm assuming Larry had to go back to the pub. I, 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 I know him pretty well. So Johnny if he's in Bob. Dublin, it's going to be the same as it is me. It's, it's 9.30 in the evening. It's going to be the same in Dublin. Right? Yeah, yeah. Well, that uh, I, I know Larry pretty well. Um, <laughs> moving we got a lot of questions. Moving on. Sure. Uh, we have Colm asking, can you log in directly to Azure AD with Windows 10? without an on-premises AD? If so, is there some version of group policy that can be applied to the client's PCs? Okay, and yes, again, that's a similar question as asked earlier. Um, and again, um, Azure AD Domain Services is your friend. Okay. This is um, an add-on to Azure AD, and it's called Azure AD Domain Services. Hey, we got Ron Replied Hardy. Policy. Ron, I'm going to get to you in a second. Are, are you ready for the next question? Uh, of course. Okay. Uh, we have uh, Link Potterfield, Porterfield asking, uh, thanks for the great presentation. Oh, he's just, uh, it's a compliment. I need to cut out a little early. Um, Ron hey, Hardy. Compliments uh, always great. Yeah, yeah, no, you know, we'll take compliments where we can get them, let me tell you. <laughs> um, this line of work. Ron Hardy, friend of mine. So Ron Hardy's in Gig Harbor. I'm on Bainbridge Island. So these are across the water from Seattle. So Ron, appreciate you attending. And Ron is saying, need details on his Redmond appearance. Um, I'm assuming if Ron types in this URL that you have on the screen, that's something Ron can do right away. Absolutely. And then Ron is asking, can a link uh, to Oxford training Redmond be sent in the follow-up email for convenience. So, Ron, you got it. Can you see that link there on the screen right there? That's the yep. place to go to yep. and our training course. We'll get that out. We have uh, Raymond asking, um, can an external product like RSA uh, uh, combined, be combined with uh, AAD? Can an external product like RDS be combined with AAD? Okay, you originally said RSA, which I think is what you mean, right? Um, yeah. And the answer yeah. is uh, yes. Um, in uh, Azure AD, there is a, um, you can create a virtual machine that is an RSA virtual machine. Um, so it's already there. You can click the button, enable it, configure it for your RSA, and then it can work. Uh, so the short answer is yes. 
Okay, Scott Buchanan pays his compliments. Wonderful webinar. Uh, consider a pay raise. You deserve it. Uh, oh, I hope he's talking about me. Thank you, Scott. I hereby and forthwith am going to give myself a pay raise. Ron I, Hardy uh, me too. <laughs> oh, you too? Okay, man, you too. <laughs> Ron Hardy says, thanks, and finally, um, and we are at 1.30. We do promise to end by 1.30 technically. Uh, Wayne says, uh, great information. Must get back to work. See you next week. Uh, Colm says, thanks, very, infor very informative. Colm, we're going to make that the final word. We are at time. And so, Paul, I want to thank you, sir, and, and certainly release you to go join Larry in the pub. <laughs> I'm Although on my way to Dublin the... as we speak. Yep, yep, two different locations. Um, folks, next week it's Carl Palachek saying bat time, and that will be uh, MSP branding. Tomorrow we have high availability with Veeam. Go to SMB Nation, click on webinars to join us tomorrow for high availability. We'll see you at Inspire, we'll see you at ChannelCon. And uh, hey, Paul, really appreciate it. If, if you came in late, unfortunately Grant had a family emergency. Paul uh, signed up on short notice. Totally, pre Paul. We want to loop you back in this fall uh, when we do the next round of series. So, really okay, appreciate. Okay, where I am, if you want me. And and there we have the uh, the course information on the screen. Jenny, I think we're there. Folks, have a fantastic day. Have a great day. We'll see you soon.